privilege of our guest this morning, Ambassador Ang San. So you appreciate what he's what he's going to talk about, and uh, you can appreciate his background in three short stages. Uh, he's a congenital diplomat, meaning it's in his blood. His father was the first ambassador to China about 1950, and his father was also the first ambassador to the United Nations. Number two, Ambassador Ang Sai Han was trained in Moscow, as you'd expect, since Mongolia was the first uh, satellite of the Soviet Union and was under uh, communist rule for some 70 years. He finished uh, his education in Moscow, including a doctor degree, very prestigious institute where they trained their diplomats and uh, their lawyers. He was trained in, in law, international law. But he decided instead of practicing law, as he thought at first, he would uh, go into diplomacy. He's had a number of important assignments. Uh, in his own country, he has been the National Security Advisor, advisor to the President of Mongolia, and very involved in policy and planning. Had other tasks there in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ulaanbaatar. In the, United, in the last five years, his assignment's been at the United Nations, and there, because of his experience and his competence in languages, He's had some very important responsibilities. He'll talk about some of those and how he's gone about that work in his lecture this morning on the role of small states in the world, in the United Nations. Uh, in the General Assembly, he's been involved in a number of important committees and been, has been the committee chairman or vice chairman of a number of those important committees. He's been mainly concerned with, uh, 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 for one thing, landlocked nations. Mongolia is locked between uh, Russia, Siberia on the north, and China. And the access to the sea for many nations, including Afghanistan, is important. Also, he's been interested in disarmament and able to take the initiative on some of, uh, initiatives on uh, disarmament, on the law of the sea, the problem of nuclear free zones, and the, uh, the, he was elected as the chair of the legal committee in the General Assembly of the United Nations. Most of these, actually all of these assignments have been within the General Assembly of the United Nations during his five-year uh, assignment there, and we'll hope that will continue. Please welcome Ambassador Ang Sai Han from Mongolia. Uh, thank you, Professor Hayer, for... Uh introducing me to this audience. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank the university for inviting me to address you and to talk to you about one of the issues that you don't read much in the press, but I hope that you will find it interesting and perhaps even useful in your studies and in your future work. As uh, Professor has, Hayu has already said, the, I will talk uh, briefly about the role of smaller states in international relations. I think uh, this topic is a very, uh, very important topic. Now it's becoming a very important topic due to the reasons uh, that if you uh, uh, look and uh, you re read in the press, you find that most of the trouble spots in the world are in, not in uh, Europe or in America, but in, in uh, regions where the countries are either small or medium-sized. The smaller states uh, play now increasing role in international relations because much depends whether there is going to be a, a, an international conflict an international incident or uh, outbreak of uh, disease much might depend on the policies of small states because that's uh, where uh, it's likely to happen. Even the disasters, the uh, disasters like, like uh, hurricanes, the small states are the ones who become usually the victims and are the ones uh, who need help and assistance and understanding from international uh, players 
although we know very well that international relations are dominated by larger states, by interactions and relations among uh, larger states. It's very important. But nevertheless, the object of international relations have always been usually the smaller states. The criteria of smaller states are different, as you might know. The, uh, that depends on the size of a country, of a population of that country. For example, Mongolia, uh, size, the territory of Mongolia is 1.6 uh, million square kilometers. That uh, would uh, be equal to the uh, size of Britain, France, Germany, and Italy taken together. It's, it's the 16th largest country in the world. But we consider ourselves as a small country because of our population. Our population is about 2.3 million. It's a little bit larger, I guess, than the population of Utah State. So the, uh, the size of the territory, size of the, uh, of the population is important, as well as the level of development. Whether the country is a strong country or a weak country, that um, much depends on that. Whether the country can defend itself militarily or otherwise from the encroachments of other countries. That also is a very important criteria to identify a country as small or big or small. And of course, the geographical location. Mongolia will always be a small country compared to our two neighbors. Russia with a population of 150 million and China with a population of 1.3 billion. Uh, in international relations, we should always distinguish between small states and weak states. Small states and failed states. Uh, small states uh, do not necessarily have to be weak or failed states. Look at Singapore. Singapore is a small country, small population, but nevertheless, its uh, growth rate, its uh, weight in international economic relations, its weight in international relations, especially in Southeast Asia, is uh, uh, very big and it is growing. On the other hand, you see, uh, let's say, Afghanistan, a country, a landlocked country, with a population of almost two, uh, 27 million. One third of the population are now living abroad, meaning as refugees in neighboring countries. It is a typical uh, failed state, and uh, again, failed states are not necessarily you know, the smallest states. That's what I wanted to make uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning of my talk. The small states, there have always been small states in the world, and uh, we have noted three waves of creation of small states after World War II. The first wave was at the beginning, started at the beginning of 1950s, and throughout the 1960s, we have seen emergence of uh, smaller and or medium-sized states in Africa. Decolonization process brought in about 40 countries with their uh, goals, achievements, with their problems and challenges. And they have all become members of the United Nations. The second uh, wave of uh, small states was in 1960s. 70s, 70s and 80s when small Pacific Island countries declared their independence and all wanted to join the United Nations all wanted to be part of uh, the international community which the United Nations members, member states have accepted them but they came in with their own problems as well as with the promises of putting their own uh, efforts to uh, the noble aims of the United Nations. And the third wave, as you might know, uh, of small states, creation of small states started with the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Fifteen states have uh, emerged, two of them large ones, Ukraine and Russia, but other, uh, other states have always been small states. And of course, with the disintegration of Yugoslavia, a number of small states have also been created. The small states, what uh, unites them is that they have uh, uh, problems and challenges that the, the larger countries have difficulties to understand 
but they are common to these uh, countries. I would say that about three-fourths of the United Nations membership are small states or medium-sized states. So the United Nations sometimes is perceived that it is much more uh, that uh, smaller and medium states need much more United Nations than the larger states. But uh, it's not the case. I think all countries need the United Nations. And if we don't have the United Nations, it has to be uh, invented. Because it is a forum where all the problems, international problems or national problems that, can, uh, that might be spilled into international problems can be taken up, uh, debated, and perhaps for some luck uh, uh, a solution could be found to, to these uh, problems. The, I think the uh, international relations has changed, has undergone big changes since 1990s when the Cold War period ended, when the Soviet Union disintegrated and Russia is trying to become part of uh, the uh, civilized society or part of international uh, community of nations on par with other uh, countries without bringing in a communist ideology. And that has changed, of course, the situation, not only uh, international situation, but also at the United Nations. Until 1990, I think the United Nations was pro forma a very important organization, but it uh, uh, was able to do very little because of the ideological confrontation East-West, because of the Cold War confrontation. Soviet Union and China had veto powers over many, many important issues, just like U.S., Britain, and France also had. So if there was no agreement on any issues, the United Nations was unable to do anything, was unable to act, though there were many peacekeeping operations. But nevertheless, until 1990, the peacekeeping operations mandates were very strictly limited. They were uh, asked to uh, report to the United Nations Security Council on violations of ceasefire agreements only. Since 1990, the peacekeeping operations has changed dramatically. They are now uh, the United Nations uh, Blue Beret. The United Nations forces are now taking uh, an active part in peace building, in post-conflict peace building. And that is uh, an entirely new uh, concept that is, was made possible because of the end of uh, the Cold War. And the role of the smallest countries now in, at the United Nations is also increasing. Before you were either with the, with the Soviet bloc or with the Western bloc. The non-aligned countries tried to uh, play a fair or let's say a game of uh, uh, mediator, but uh, uh, it wasn't able to do that. So the post-Cold War uh, period, I think, is uh, increasing the chances for working for peace, increasing the weight of smaller countries. We can take the, uh, Mongolia as an example, but I'll come to that uh, in, uh, in a minute. Since I'm ambassador of Mongolia, I guess I would have to say a few things, uh, a few words about my, my country as well. My country, Mongolia, as you know, is situated between Russia and China, two great superpowers, and our foreign policy and our destiny has always been tied with them. That Mongolia uh, throughout the 20th century has been siding with the Soviets. The Soviets, just like uh, President Bush has said uh, after the 9-11, the Soviets asked, uh, uh, were saying that either you are with us or you are against us. Now, the, the President Bush was uh, saying about something different, terrorism. But at that time, the Soviets uh, made sure that countries that are supportive of the Soviet Union or are allied with the Soviet Union had to be 100% allies. There should be no dissension. And we, as a small country, had uh, many difficulties in doing that because we cannot espouse only the Soviet policies. We are smaller countries. We see that there are problems that the Soviet Union would not feel, would not even... Uh, Notice while these problems we had uh, ourselves, just like uh, many other smaller countries, 
But until 1990, with a strict Cold War uh, discipline, we were siding with the Soviets. In 1990, the uh, uh, situation has changed. Now we, like many other small countries, are able to play a much larger or, let's say, much more active role in international relations and especially at uh, the United uh, Nations. In fact, there, is, uh, there are a number of uh, regional groups inside the United Nations, like a forum of small states, where we try to uh, coordinate our policies vis-à-vis -vis one issue or vis-à-vis, -vis, uh, let's say, the problems that uh, the United Nations is uh, facing. Again, we had a, a big debate who, uh, which country should be considered as a small country, a small state. As I have said, there are many criteria, and this time at the United Nations we have agreed that the, the countries that have a population of 10 million or less would, be, uh, would form part of uh, this uh, group of countries. Well, the, uh, the problems of which you know, are identical, and we can always uh, deal with issues based on our own solidarity, on solidarity of interest of the smaller countries. Now, coming uh, to the issue, the role of smaller states, whether they can or how can they play a uh, uh, more active role in uh, international relations. I'll take an example of uh, my country, Mongolia, a country which is a smaller country, but nevertheless, we, like many other smaller countries, are trying to be as active as possible at the United Nations, because the United Nations is the sole organization which is based on and tries to enforce the principle of sovereign equality of states. Whether you are from Barbados, Mongolia, or from the United States, you have one voice at, in the General Assembly. And that is, it, the General Assembly is the uh, meeting place, I would say, of diplomats, of heads of state and government to focus and to address many issues. Now, reality is, is, is such that among these countries, there are some countries who are much more powerful, who have much more weight, who are much richer, and that's where I think the uh, other uh, organs of the United Nations come in. The Security Council. Security Council is uh, an organ which is primarily deal, uh, which primarily deals with maintenance of international peace and security. With respect to peace and security, of course, Mongolia cannot be equated to China or to the United States. That's where reality is. So the Security Council is based on different principles, although the principle of sovereign equality is also respected meaning that if Mongolia wants to bring in, let's say, a problem or, or address an issue, uh, Mongolia, like other countries, can do that at, in the Security Council. But the decision will be taken by the, all, only by the members of the Security Council, the 15 countries, including five nuclear weapon states, Britain, U.S., France, Russia, and uh, China. Notwithstanding these uh, differences, the smaller countries try to uh, play uh, uh, an active role in international uh, relations. Mm -hmm. Mongolia uh, was admitted in the United Nations in 1962. It took us 15 years to become a member of the United Nations. Though we participated in the War of Liberation, we have uh, donated uh, warm clothing, food, medicine, as well as squadrons of uh, airplanes to the Soviet Union to, to help the Soviet Union to, in its war against uh, Nazi Germany. Then we directly participated in the war uh, in, uh, in uh, the Pacific in 1945. Nevertheless, it took us 15 years to become a member of the United Nations. Why? Because of the uh, superpower rivalries. So we were considered by the, uh, by, the US, uh, by the United States, Britain, and France as a proxy or, let's say, as an additional voice to the Soviet Union at that time. So the, 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 uh, the Western countries didn't want Mongolia to be 
but to become a member of the United Nations. And the Soviets also didn't want any other countries to join the uh, United Nations because they were afraid that those countries would be siding with the Western countries. So it took us 15 years and uh, uh, then uh, in 1961, as a result of package deal, we were uh, admitted as a uh, uh, member of the United Nations. But since 1970s, I think uh, any country which uh, considered itself as a sovereign country had green light to become a member of the United Nations. But at that time, it was quite difficult. So we were, uh, joined the United Nations in 1961, but in 1962, we already uh, drafted a resolution saying that the United Nations should focus more on environmental issues. Before then, the, I think the United Nations member states were focusing more on questions of war and peace and uh, on questions of refugees, but not on environmental issues. So uh, we believe that that started the trend. Now, uh, today, about two -third, one third of the, uh, the issues debated at the United Nations deal one way or another with environmental issues. Now, now during the height of uh, Cold War, during the Cold War, the smaller states were expected to follow the line either of the West or of the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, smaller countries also try to play uh, an, uh, an active role. You might remember uh, that uh, in 1960, Czechoslovakia, which was part of uh, the Soviet bloc, and member of Warsaw Pact has initiated an item saying that we should now uh, codify the uh, principles of uh, conduct of states uh, with each other, principles uh, called friendly relations principles of state. The larger countries were not uh, at that time uh, very enthusiastic because they had their own agenda, but because of Czechoslovakia's uh, uh, initiative, it took up about 15 years, but nevertheless, at the end of, the, of uh, 15 years, the United Nations thanked uh, Czechoslovakia and adopted a set of uh, uh, declaration which specifies in greater detail what UN means when it says non-use of force, non-threat of use of force, non-interference in, in, in the internal affairs of other countries, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the uh, 1970s, Mongolia had Soviet troops on its territory. They were uh, sent into Mongolia as if to protect Mongolia from China. The Soviet troops had nuclear weapons. As you might know, uh, in 1970s, the so Sino-Soviet conflict was becoming one of the major problems in international relations. The, uh, the Soviets had at that time, I think, 53 divisions, combat-ready divisions on their border, including in Mongolia. China had about 1.2 million soldiers on their border with the Soviet Union and Mongolia again. Mongolia was caught in, in between. And at that time, since uh, the smaller countries didn't have say in the Zaman negotiations, Mongolia uh, put forward a suggestion, and it was accepted by the majority, that perhaps the uh, government should be held accountable for their, uh, uh, for their uh, nuclear armaments policies. And because of that, the United Nations every year discusses this issue. Even today, after the end of the Cold War, discusses the issue. What the nuclear weapon states have done, have been doing during the past year, in order to achieve the aims of disarmament. Of course, the Soviets were not very happy, but once we had, had, that, uh, uh, we had put forward that, that item for discussion, they had no uh, uh, other alternative but to accept and support it. So sometimes the small countries would do something, knowing quite well that that might not be accepted by the, small, by the larger countries, but I think that, was, uh, that played its role also in 1980s, when, as you might know, there was a lot of discussion about uh, pushing two missiles, about SS-20 uh, medium-range Soviet missiles stationed in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, in, uh, in 
uh, Central Asia and the Far East. So I think the discussion of these issues also uh, showed to the nuclear uh, weapon states that they should be held accountable not only to the uh, smaller countries but to their own people because the discussions of the G General Assembly are open and whoever wants is interested can always get the summaries of the discussions. So hopefully we uh, made some difference in uh, that area. Now, uh, Mongolia is situated between two nuclear weapon states. And as I have said, this, uh, the Soviet had their nuclear weapons in Mongolia trained on China in 1970s, and until I think uh, early 1980s. And China, by that time, already had a couple of hundred of nuclear weapons as, uh, themselves. None of them, at that time, uh, were capable of reaching the United States. Some of them uh, uh, could have reached uh, maybe Moscow, but most of them were uh, tactical or medium range. And Mongolia was caught in between uh, these two powers. And as I was uh, given to understand, in uh, late 1960s, the Soviets even approached the United States to see what would be the uh, reaction of the U.S. if the, U, uh, if the Soviet Union would uh, uh, make a preemptive uh, nuclear strike against uh, China. They had in mind Mongolia to, to use Mongolian territory to uh, strike uh, against China because at that time the Soviets were apprehensive. They didn't want to have wars. I guess they were, uh, the mentality was thinking in wars. They didn't want to have wars on two fronts, with the U.S. and with China. China had a rudimentary, I guess, they, their Chinese nuclear weapons programs were developing very slowly. So at that time, the Soviets thought that they, they might, with an agreement, tacit agreement of the U.S., make a preemptive strike against uh, China. China, knowing that well, I think they had their weapons uh, trained again on the Soviet Union or on Mongolia. That was a big uh, lesson that we have learned. So in 1992, when the Soviets left Mongolia, we declared ourselves a nuclear weapon-free zone, a country that would not only have nuclear weapons of, their own, of its own, but would not allow other countries to place nuclear weapons or parts thereof on our territory. That, uh, uh, when we uh, put out this uh, initiative, we did not cons uh, consult with our two neighbors because we didn't know what would be their reaction. But the United Nations, the majority of the member states, were receptive and supported it. After that, our two neighbors, Russia and China, also joined the support. So now we have a situation where uh, both of our neighbors are supporting this. Uh, declaring uh, your country a nuclear weapon-free zone is one thing, but uh, having a legal basis, having other countries agree to this policy is another, and it, it, we've been negotiating with the Russians and the, and the Chinese and the, the Americans on the terms whereby they would give us nuclear assurances. Uh, we've been negotiating for about six years, uh, in the year 2000, uh, the nuclear weapon states have pledged never to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons on, in, against Mongolia and not to place nuclear weapons in Mongolia. And that is very important. Why? I'll tell you why. Because uh, Mongolia is a very small country, a weak country. In times of crisis, either our northern neighbor or southern neighbor might be tempted to use Mongolia's territory to uh, place nuclear or other weapons of mass destruction. That's what we, do, what we don't want, and I'm sure that if uh, uh, we get uh, security assurances, Mongolia will become a safer place, a place from where uh, no other country will use Mongolian territory against another territory. So this is uh, also, we believe, uh, a contribution to international peace and security because a, a territory that is the uh, equivalent to Britain, France, Germany, and uh, Italy taken together will be a territory where there will be no nuclear or other weapons of mass destruction. And that is, I think, is uh, very important. Mongolia, of course, as a smaller country, we try to focus at the United Nations, like other smaller countries, on economic and social issues. That's where I think the real problems lie. Uh, 
in the post Cold War period, I think the international community is trying to uh, focus on these issues three issues economic development, social development, and environment. These are the three very important issues that the international community is trying to focus on. What can, be the, what can smaller countries contribute to uh, these issues? Mongolia, for example, will have always been strong in advocating education for all. Uh, by late 1980s, 95% of our population uh, was literate. And we believe that uh, literacy is a very potent, very strong weapon to, fi to fight against poverty, to fight against inequality, to strengthen human rights, and so on and so forth. To empower a pe uh, person is very important. And you know that three uh, quarters of the people uh, of the planet live in developing countries. And there, uh, the question of education is not a priority, has never been a priority. It was the question of survival, of political uh, renaissance, economic survival, but uh, the question of uh, education has always been relegated uh, to, to uh, back state. So, uh, last year the General Assembly has adopted a resolution on our initiative, whereby we have uh, declared that by year 2015, the international community should take steps so that by year 2015, the, the number of people, uneducated people, would be uh, halved, would be reduced by uh, 50%. Today, uh, there are 880 million people who do not know how to read and write. And if you don't know how to read and write, you cannot uh, fight for your rights or for the rights of your family and so on. Uh, according to that resolution, uh, every year the member states would have to report to the Secretary General and to the United Nations what they are doing, how much they are allocating in their budgets to support education. What are, what are they doing, for example, to make sure that uh, adult illiteracy is reduced? What is reflected in their national development plans? What uh, measures they are taking to make sure that uh, computer illiteracy question is addressed. There are many, many questions. And uh, hopefully the United Nations, starting from next year, would be able to focus on this issue. Of course, the target of halving the, educate, uh, the people who do not uh, know how to read and write by 2015 is a really big challenge. Maybe not in the U.S., maybe not in uh, the Western European countries, but in Africa, in parts of Asia, in some uh, countries of Latin America, it really is a challenge. And we're trying to focus the energy and, uh, of the United Nations on this question. How the United Nations can help? There are many uh, countries that have a lot of experience. They have uh, hardware that, that, can be, that, that can contribute to uh, addressing this uh, problem. There are 113 million children, school uh, age children, that uh, do not attend schools. I'm sure that many of them might become criminals. We don't uh, rule out that uh, some of them might end up even becoming terrorists. Of course, that's not the main reason. The main reason for us is just to make sure that by 2015, these uh, 113 million children that uh, do not uh, have, do not attend schools, will be attending schools. That by 2015, there will be no ch no child that would be out of school. Maybe the first uh, uh, target should be that all children should get four years of education at least. You cannot change the world. Uh, uh, instantly in one day so 
perhaps by year 2010, all children should get uh, uh, four years of education. By the year 2015, perhaps the secondary education that every person or every child should get a sec secondary education. These are the uh, problems that you know the developing countries are, are facing, and since the larger countries, the bigger powers are very busy looking after the questions connected with international peace and security, Afghanistan, peacekeeping operations. Perhaps small countries would be able to provide some ideas and focus the international community on these and other respected, uh, and other issues. Another issue uh, where Mongolia is uh, uh, quite uh, active is rural women. Mongolia, the, the two-thirds of our population are in the country, live in the countryside, and half of them are women. And in the developing countries, as you might know, rural women, women that live in the countryside are the people who have been neglected throughout history. And uh, what we are trying to do is to focus also on the plight, on the status of uh, rural women. Because the, uh, the rural women are the ones who are not employed, whose work is not uh, 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 is ignored, who tries to look after the children, to give them education, make sure that the children are well fed and so on and so forth. But at the same time, they don't have any rights. They don't know their own rights. And it took uh, the Mongolian delegation for about, about seven years to have the uh, General Assembly accept a resolution in year, uh, 1998. For the first time in history, the United Nations, by consensus, said that yes, rural women have the right, uh, the same rights as men, including to inherit land, to own land, to inherit property, and so on and so forth. There are many countries in the world where the woman, the status of woman is not, uh, has not been uh, identified, where women considered as uh, their place is in the family, and even in the family uh, business, they have no rights, no voice. So in 1998, for the first time, after six years of negotiations, the General Assembly has adopted a resolution confirming the rights of women, of rural women, to own land and to have the same rights of inheritance like other people. We're talking about 1.7 billion people in the world. The larger countries, again, they're dealing with larger issues, but we believe that this is not a small issue as well. After that, we have asked the member states to report back what is being done to implement that resolution. Some countries, including some Islamic countries, are based on this uh, consensus resolution. They have taken this resolution to their parliament and are saying, look, this is the world standard, and we have to live up to that world standard. And they are trying, uh, beginning already, to introduce legislation whereby w the rights of rural women would, uh, would be uh, protected, defined and protected. We as uh, members of small countries believe that we are, uh, uh, it is a big thing. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where we are trying to be as active as uh, uh, possible. Another area, I guess... Uh, uh, it will take me five minutes, then we can get to the uh, second stage. The question of negotiations. I was telling my colleagues uh, when I was uh, meeting them earlier. Negotiations are the main instrument of international politics, of diplomacy. But so far, there has never been any codified rules of international negotiations. The larger countries are comfortable with the absence of those uh, uh, rules, because they have other means to influence. They have power, they have financial power, they have economic power, they have many friends and allies who would support you. But for smaller countries, it's difficult. 
And it's not only for small countries, but we believe that in the future, if you want to really negotiate and settle a question, you have to have special rules, which you expect the other uh, side would also respect. This is the question that we have raised in 1998, and it took us about two years of hard negotiations. The larger countries were not very enthusiastic, but once it was on the table, they had no uh, choice but also to start negotiating on the rules of negotiations. And in, at the end of the day, we were able to agree, all of us, 189 countries, on 14 rules of negotiations, of conducting negotiations. What do we mean negotiating in good faith? It's there. That negotiations, when you negotiate, you don't, uh, when you negotiate, the two parties negotiate, if there is a question that uh, affects vital interests of a third country, you should also consult that country before it was diff different. For example, in 1950s, we found out at the end of 1950s that the Chinese approached the Soviets about a deal whereby the Soviets would hand over Mongolia to China. And the Soviets uh, told us uh, at the beginning of 1960s just to let us know how uh, uh, dangerous the Chinese are. They wouldn't have told us otherwise. But what we are trying to do through the United Nations is to make sure that such things never happen. And if such things happen, the results of negotiations should be considered as val invalid, as null and void. And it was agreed by all 800, uh, 189 countries that there should be such rules and that su such rules should be respected. Of course, that does not mean that after adoption of uh, the, uh, those set of rules, the negotiations uh, will uh, proceed smoothly. No. We're realists. But at the same time, at least now you have the rules uh, against which you can judge a state, whether you are negotiating in good faith or not, whether your negotiations are uh, aimed at achieving concrete results or they are just make-believe uh, negotiations so that you can do something else behind the negotiations. So those, uh, those are the uh, small things that smaller countries try to bring in into international relations. But if you think about it, I think uh, we are trying to make a difference. And hopefully with a more democratized world, we'll be able to contribute more in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please. Yes, please. Um, what has been the general reaction to the states, the small states in the UN, to the uh, when the United States retreated from the Eight Man Treaty with Russia? What, what has their reaction been? Has there been like any support of it, against it? Well, the ADM Treaty. Uh, there are uh, two questions. First, question of principle. If the United States. Uh, withdraws from the uh, uh, ABM treaty that might uh, have a precedent. When a country, when it feels that it is strong enough to do uh, away a treaty, that might set a bad precedent. The smaller countries, we don't want that. The smaller countries are always in favor of cooperation and in favor of legality, development of international law. But I think the U.S. Uh, position uh, uh, might adversely affect uh, this uh, position because we would really want to have United States and Russia negotiate some kind of an agreement and not just close the door saying that now we don't need that treaty. So I would say the smaller countries would have wanted the U.S. to be more uh, cooperative, to negotiate with the Russians, and then once the Russians and the Americans have an agreement, then according to international law, the later agreement will supersede the previous one and not close the door shut. Yes, yes please. 
Uh, well, uh, we have dip, uh, we have diplomatic relations with Russia and China, meaning that once when we establish relations, we have agreed that we will recognize China as it is, meaning that Inner Mongolia is part of China, like and we uh, recognize Taiwan as part of China. We don't have any territorial problems or designs with, uh, over China, although Inner Mongolia was part of China a couple of hundreds of years ago. But now if you look at the reality, only 15% of the population are Mongolians, and 85% are, most of them are Chinese. Now, even if you uh, take, put one and one together, we wouldn't want to have... Uh, let's say, Inner Mongolia with a large Chinese population becoming part of Mongolia, then we will become a minority in itself. But uh, even uh, without going into detail, I would say we recognize Russia as it is, meaning that uh, Buryatia, which was part of Mongolia in the 16th, uh, in the uh, 15th, 16th century, we uh, recognize uh, Buryatia as part of Russia. We don't want any changes in borders or changes in uh, uh, territories. I think we had enough bloodshed. I think we have uh, enough uh, uh, problems with territorial issues. But on the other hand, we know that there are many Mongolians living in Inner Mongolia and in Buryat Mongolia, which is part of Russia. What we want to have is good non-political relations, family-to-family -family relations, people-to-people -people relations, cultural relations, trade relations, yes. So when we approach this question without uh, having other intentions, I think the Russians and the uh, Chinese are very receptive. They understand that and they allow their people to come to Mongolia without visa on extended stay. That's what we want. We want the people to live better and not to uh, raise many questions. That will question. And the ambassador has another appointment. Yes, please. That's a very important question. I hope it will, it will take me two minutes at least to answer that question. Mongolia is a landlocked uh, uh, country. There are about 30 landlocked country developing countries. And most of them are the least developed ones. That means people live on less than a dollar a day. The problem is that when we want to trade, for example, Mongolia wants to trade with the U.S., you have to trade through Russia or China. And that is, becomes very expensive, very, very uh, difficult, especially if you have bad, you have on bad terms with your neighbor. Then they can always bring up many, many problems. And even with uh, a good relation that we have with Russia and China, we pay about 6.8% of our GDP. 6.8% of our GDP as transit transportation costs and services to Russia and China. This is a very, very big amount of money. Our entire defense budget equals to only 2%. So you can imagine that it is a very big problem. And Mongolia at the United Nations for five years served as the leader of the landlocked developing countries. We are making some progress, but much depends on bilateral relations. You have to be realists. Now you're talking about Afghanistan. You're talking about the composition of the provisional government, who is in, who is out. But the main question, as a, a representative of a small country, I would say the main question would be its relations with Iran and Pakistan. Because in the end, if Afghanistan wants to develop, it would have to develop its trade and other relations with other countries beyond, besides uh, uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan and Iran. Iran and uh, Pakistan. And that's where the, the, the trick is. Because today, 40% of their export earnings goes to pay for transit transportation services to Iran or to, uh, to Pakistan. So in those conditions, it is very difficult to be competitive. Even if you have a very good product, it will be, it will, by the time it reaches the United States or any other country, its price will be so high that it would be easier for you to trade with your neighbors 
but when you trade with your neighbors, you become dependent uh, economically on your neighbors. That is a very, very big question, and this a group of 30 countries, landlocked developing countries, we're trying to focus uh, uh, on this question as well. Of course, uh, the, uh, our neighbors are reluctant because they will be losing one of the way, means to influence, of their influence over Mongolia, maybe over Uganda or Afghanistan and so on and so forth. This is the